The Witch of Blackbird Pond Chapter 17 Part 3 She tore off her petticoat and waved it hysterically, but she dare not shout, and if she could not attract their notice, the dolphin would sail past down the river and their chance would be gone. Kicking off her shoes, Kit waded into the water, plunged in, and struck out toward the ship. It was a very short swim, but she had overdrawn her strength for days past. She was panting when the black hull loomed over her head, and at first she could barely raise her voice above the wash of the ship. She drew a careful breath and tried again. There was a cry above her and a sound of running feet. Ahoy! All hands! Man overboard! Tis a woman! Hold on there, ma'am. We're coming. She heard shouted orders, a thumping and creaking of ropes. Then the lifeboat swung out over her head and lowered with a smack into the water. Nat and the red-headed sailor were inside, and she had never before been so happy to see anyone. I knew it, groaned the red-headed one as she clung, gasping to the side of the boat. Kit, what kind of game is this? Hannah, she's in terrible trouble, Nat. They burned her house. Please, can you take her on the dolphin? They dragged her over the side of the boat. Where is she? Nat demanded. Tell the captain to heave to, he yelled up toward the deck. We're going ashore. There, pointed Kit, by that pile of logs. We've been there all night. I didn't know what to do, and when I saw the ship... All at once, she was sobbing and babbling like a three-year-old about the witch hunt and the chase through the cornfield and the man who'd come so close. Nat's hands closed over hers hard and steady. Tis all right, Kit, he said over and over. We'll take you both on and get you some dry clothes. Just hold on a few minutes more till we get Hannah. The boat scraped the shore. Still dazed, Hannah accepted the miracle and the prospect of a journey like a docile child. Then, after two shaky steps turned obstinate, she would not set foot on the boat without her cat. I can't go off without her, she insisted. I just can't, and thee ought to know that, Nat. She'd just grieve her heart out with no home to go to, and me gone off on a ship. Then I'll get her, said Nat. You wait here and keep quiet, both of you. Kit was outraged. If she had been Nat, she would have picked Hannah up and carried her off in the boat with no more nonsense. As he strode up the bank, she scrambled after him through the wet underbrush. You're crazy, Nat, she protested, her teeth chattering with cold. No cat is worth it. You've got to get her out of here. If you could have heard those people. If she's set on that cat, she's going to have it. They've taken everything else. Nat stood in the midst of the charred cinder that had been the little house. Damn them, he choked. Curse them all. He kicked a smoldering log viciously. They searched the trampled garden, and presently they heard a cautious meow. The yellow cat inched warily from beneath a pumpkin vine. She did not take to the idea of capture. They had to stalk her, one on each side of the garden, and Nat finally dived full length under a bush, dragged the cat out, and wrapped it tightly in his own shirt. Back at the shore, Hannah received the writhing bundle with joy and climbed obediently into the rowboat. Where are we going, Nat? she asked trustfully. I'm taking you to Saybrook for a visit with my grandmother. You'll be good company for her, Hannah. Come on, Kit. Father will go on without us. I'm not going, Nat. All I wanted was to see Hannah safe. Nat straightened up. I think you'd better, Kit, he said quietly. Till this thing blows over, at least. This is our last trip before winter. 
We'll find a place for you in Saybrook and bring you back first trip next spring. Kit shook her head. Or you can go to the West Indies with us. Barbados! The tears sprang to her eyes. I can't, Nat. I have to stay here. The concern in his eyes hardened to awareness. Of course, he said courteously. I forgot. You're going to be married. Tis mercy, she stammered. She's terribly ill. I couldn't go. I just couldn't, not knowing. Nat looked intently at her and took one step nearer. The blue eyes were very close. Kit. Ahoy there! There was a bellow from the dolphin. What's keeping you? Nat, quick. They'll hear the shouting. Nat jumped into the boat. You'll be all right. You need to get warm. I'll go home now. Only hurry. She stood watching as the boat pulled away from the sand. Halfway to the ship, Nat turned to stare back at her. Then he raised an arm silently. Kit raised her own arm to wave back, and then she turned and started back along the shore. She dared not wait to see them reach the dolphin. In another moment, she would lose every shred of common sense and pride and fling herself into the water after the rowboat and plead with them not to leave her behind. Though it was long past daybreak now, her luck still held. She met no one in the north field. Once, she dodged behind a brush pile as the town herder came by with some cows to pasture. She reached the house without further danger. The shed door was still unbolted, and she let herself in and crept noiselessly through the house. She heard a murmur of voices, and as she reached the hallway, the door to the kitchen opened. Is that you, Kit? Aunt Rachel peered at her. We decided to let you sleep, poor child. Dr. Bookley has been here all night. Praise God, he says the fever is broken. In her joy and weariness, Aunt Rachel did not even notice the sodden dress and hair under Kit's woolen cloak. And we'll stop here and start Chapter 18 in the next video. Until then, as Tigger says, ta-ta for now. Thanks so much for watching. I love you guys. Bye-bye.